Good afternoon. I'm Jane Angel, Executive Director at the Council of Australia, uh, Council of Australian University Librarians. Um, so today I'm joined on this call by Mark Sutherland, Executive Director at, at Open Access Australasia. Um, and together we'll be hosting um, this session of the Australian Open Science Network. Um, a little bit of ha about housekeeping. Um, we have already started the recording. Um, it's completely up to you if you'd like to have your cameras um, on or off, um, but please do have your microphones muted so that we can hear our presenters today. Um, Janet Cashel from Open Access Australasia, she'll be um, assisting us this afternoon and recording and compiling your questions during the session. Um, please feel free to add any comments into the chat or questions and Janet will collate them for us. Uh, and at the end of the session, I'll be passing over to Mark and Mark will um, pose the questions and wrap up our session today. So I'd just like to start with an acknowledgement of country. The Australian Open Science Network, which comprises CALL, OAA, and our colleagues at ARDC, acknowledge the traditional custodians, custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. And we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly those who are on the call today, as well as our colleague, our Maori colleagues in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'd also like to acknowledge the land on which I live and work, that is that of the Ghana people on the Adelaide Plains in South Australia, and I acknowledge that I live and work on lands that were never ceded. If you'd like to share where you're calling in from today, we would lo really love to hear that in the chat. So today you're joining a webinar from the Australian Open Science Network, and we have two speakers here presenting to you from Invest in Open Infrastructure, an organisation that works to increase the investment in and adoption of open infrastructure to further equitable access to participation in research by providing actionable evidence-based guidance and tools to institutions and funders of open infrastructure. Today we have two fantastic speeches, Jerry Salanga who's joining us from Nairobi in Kenya and also Nikki Wako who's joining us from The Hague in um, the Netherlands. And so thank you very much to Jerry and Nikki for getting up super early this morning um, and enjoy and joining us today on the other side of the world where we're going into our late afternoon and eve evening. So a little bit of biography about our two speakers. Um, Jerry specializes in strategic communications, graphic design, proposal development, and public relations. Jerry holds a bachelor's degree in environmental studies, specializing in community development from Kenyatta University. And he's currently undertaking a postgraduate diploma in public relations. Before joining IOI, Jerry held senior roles in communication and marketing in the wildlife conservation, agriculture and social impact sectors. So welcome, Jerry. Moving on to Nikki. Um, Nikki was the Advocacy and Donor Engagement Manager at Gion in Amsterdam. Gion is a collaboration of European national research and education networks that deliver infrastructure and services to advance research and education. And whilst at Gion, she led initiatives that significantly advanced digital transformation of research and education across sectors in Africa, securing vital policy recognition and support for future projects. Nikki's also served as a foreign service officer, representing her country in high level diplomatic engagements and negotiating humanitarian and development aid. As a passionate advocate for social entrepreneurship and community driven initiatives, Nikki co-founded IFRA, which stands for Voices of Young Refugees in Europe, a youth network that amplifies the voices of individual refugees and refugee serving organizations across Europe. Nikki is also a board director of Impact Direct, a social enterprise that connects donors with impactful NGOs. Nikki, Jerry, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to what you have to share with us. And I'm going to pass to Jerry, who's going to present first. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jane. 
uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, thank you so much for the rest of the colleagues who have joined uh, the presentation today. Uh, as Jane mentioned, my name is Jerry Selanga. I'm working as the engagement uh, coordinator responsible for networks that invest in open infrastructure um, based out of Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, we are going to do this presentation in two different parts. I'm going to start uh, about uh, an overview of what open invest in open infrastructure is. Then I'm going to give an overview of our InfraFinder tool. Then after that, my colleague Nick is going to come in and talk about the state of open infrastructure report. Uh, so let's uh, get the party started. Yes. So Invest in Open Infrastructure is an organization that's dedicated to increasing the investment and adoption of open infrastructure to further equitable access and participation in, in research. Invest in Open Infrastructure was formed four years ago by a number of actors uh, who were in the open access, open science, open infrastructure realms that were looking at how to strategically and systematically increase investment in the open infrastructure ecosystem. Uh, and this was precipitated by a number of things. One is that we're looking at the kind of limiting philanthropic and government investment into open infrastructure. And also the other thing that was a challenge was that there was increasing consolidation of open infrastructure tools, particularly by uh, commercial entities that were kind of uh, limiting the, the, the knowledge commons as we know. So invest in open infrastructure was kind of developed by a particular engagement at the JROST conference in 2020, that's a state side. And uh, we initially had a steering committee that set up the uh, initial systems and processes for IOI. So one of the things that we are focused on as, as investing in open infrastructure is we look to increase the investment of open infrastructure. And for this to happen, we do believe that for our systems need to be similarly designed. We work to advance a vision where open infrastructure is the default in research and scholarship. So our team at the moment is pretty decentralized. We have staff in Africa, Europe, uh, and North America, and we have been growing over time. And in terms of the approach that we take, we do take a, a research driven approach to guide strategies and action designed to increase uh, adoption and investment of open infrastructure. Another core component of our work is we look at providing resources and analysis to help funders and budget holders to assess, evaluate, and make investment decisions about open infrastructure. And also we look at being innovative and piloting solutions uh, to coordinate stakeholders, to increase the sustainability of the sector, and to further a shared agenda for uh, making open infrastructure the default in research. So when you look at investing in open infrastructure as an organization, in order for us to achieve our goal of making open infrastructure the default in, in research, we have kind of structured our work along three key pillars. And in that th three pillars is we have the funding pilots, which is where we look to catalyze investment. We have strategic support and we also have data room. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of these three core program areas. And then after that, I'll get into uh, the InfraFinder tool. So when you talk about the funding pilots, uh, here is where we are looking at uh, increasing the amount of funding and diversity uh, of those investing in open infrastructure to ensure that we are building towards a resilient, health, uh, healthy, and sustainable future for research and scholarship. If you remember one of the things that I mentioned at the top, is that one of the things that we were aimed to do is how to look at uh, catalyzing new investment that is potentially going to make it easier to uh, adopt open infrastructure. And so here we have a number of funding programs. We have what's called the Open Infrastructure Fund, which we launched earlier this year, which was giving out grants of between five and 25,000 US dollars, uh, particularly to initiatives that were looking at uh, capacity building, uh, governance and critical shared infrastructure in open. And also the, we have another facility that we are looking to launch 
uh, perhaps towards the start of 2025, the IOI fund for network adoption that is now going to be looking at provide, providing uh, at least funding of uh, 500,000 to 1.5 uh, million uh, dollars to select networks in Latin America, Africa, uh, and North America to catalyze this work. Then also in the strategic support pillar, we have tailored engagements with uh, providers, funders, and institutions to implement IOI research recommendations and to further adoption of open infrastructure. So here, for example, we work with open infrastructure entities to look at how do we be able to enhance the financial diversification, how do we look at things like governance, how do we look at things like stakeholder management, and this is more or less like an in-house service that IOI provides uh, on request to particular entities. There's a lot of work that we're already doing with a number of open infrastructure providers uh, across the world. And last but not least, we have the data room. So IOI, when we started our work was kind of to look at how do we provide evidence-based tools to actually guide actions and enhance access to research. And so we have a number of tools in this particular segment. This is where the InfraFinder tool falls. This is where the state of open infrastructure tool uh, falls, which we are going to get into in subsequent uh, slides. So, one of the things that uh, before I get into the uh, state, the infrafine and state of open is we all often get this question is what do we mean by open infrastructure? And for us, open infrastructure is a service, a protocol standard or software that the academic ecosystem needs in order to perform its functions throughout the, li uh, the research life cycle. So when you talk about the research life cycle, there's different stages in research, starting from data collection, data analysis, publication, there's a whole a lot of steps that are involved in that particular life cycle. And we are looking at these services, protocols, standards, or software that are involved in that life cycle. Uh, one of the things that we do believe is that open infrastructure is a spectrum rather than a binary. So we tend to kind of uh, look at a number of different criteria that uh, the tools or the infrastructures or the standards that we consider as open infrastructure have to meet at least one of. And these are uh, an open infrastructure in our definition needs to meet the definition of open source software. It primarily or exclusively distributes openly licensed content. It is free uh, to use for anyone, free of charge or other restrictions. There's a strong element of community governance uh, uh, and it is transparent in operations and also is operated by a non-profit or a commercial uh, entity. So here, I just wanted to kind of show uh, the, the interplay of open infrastructure within the context of the wider open science ecosystem. And so as you well know, in terms of like, if you look at the op UNESCO recommendations, Open science is an umbrella term that also encompasses other things. For example, open science, open data, open software, open design, citizen science. But then if you were to look uh, in this particular diagram at the bottom in terms of like the soil, we do have the incentives that are needed to facilitate research. We have uh, research ethics that's incredibly important but also very important, particularly as a foundational element of open science and open infrastructure is uh, the tools that actually are needed by researchers and scholars to facilitate their work, which is where the, the open research infrastructure comes into play. Uh, so I would now want to start uh, to kind of give an introduction into InfraFinder. And I would want to start from the perspective of when we were building out this particular tool, uh, we wanted to build out a tool for institutional decision makers because we've had extensive engagements with uh, institutional decision makers. We had a lot of surveys, a lot of focus groups uh, that were focused around uh, this particular segment. And one of the things that we discovered here uh, within institutional decision makers is that there was always this uh, common thread that we need a tool that would facilitate us to, to uh, be able to 
uh, ad, uh, adopt to, to know what open infrastructures are being used across the system and also to make that particular process easier. And also when you're looking at kind of like a multiplier effect or a lever, working with institutional decision makers makes sense because it gives you the element of skill. For example, when you're looking at uh, libraries, for example, that are looking at acquiring a particular uh, repository software, when you're looking at library publishing uh, or, uh, institutions that maybe are looking at acquiring a, a publishing software. So how do we facilitate and how do we make that easier? So the problem as we diagnosed through our interviews, our surveys, our focus groups, was that when it comes to finding the right infrastructure, this is typically a very complicated process. And this is challenging because there's scattered information across a different, uh, different uh, platforms in, in the ecosystem. There's different requirements and different needs for uh, the different uh, stakeholders. So for example, uh, a large university in the US might have a very different uh, requirement uh, for example, to an institution in Africa or in Latin America and Australia. And also, given the fact that there's so much spread and diversity in where people can be able to find information about open infrastructure, it can be very time consuming to kind of do that analysis and be able to identify the best option for your particular context. So one of the things that we considered when we were looking at developing this tool and what the feedback from the institutional decision makers was, was that they were looking at before I acquire or I give the green light for acquisition of an open infrastructure is the, there's a big question about cost. And so people are looking at how will this cost me in terms of labor, in terms of time. And also there's the question of maintenance and upgrades of the system. So there was a need for that clarity. Then also there's an element of de-risking the purchase. So for example, if you're going to invest in a particular open infrastructure, you would want to have some level of assurance that there's going to be stability in terms of that uh, maintenance and continuous development that would allow you to use the system over an extended period of time. Then also when you're looking at dependencies and interoperability, there's also a very strong uh, consideration by institutional decision makers to kind of look at, uh, does this already work with existing systems that we have? And also what other maybe technical uh, components are needed or dependencies are there that needs uh, are needed for this particular system to, to, to run? And then also the final component that uh, we found that uh, the, the institutions are, are considering is can this particular infrastructure further the aim of openness uh, which by extension includes open open access. So InfraFinder in itself is, is a, a tool that helps to navigate the complex uh, landscape of infrastructure services and standards to facilitate open research and scholarship. So there's three main things that you would get in InfraFinder, and this is up-to-date verified information. So at the moment we have 57 infrastructures that are spread across different uh, uh, areas of open infrastructure. So for example, there's repository tools, there's publishing tools, there's archival tools, all uh, within uh, the infra open infrastructure at the moment. We are looking at launching another update that would have an additional 57 tools in October that would give us now over 100 infrastructures and we are looking to build that particular uh, data set over time. Then also another key advantage is that you get uh, information in a centralized location. If you remember, one of the things I mentioned is that there's a challenge of information about open infrastructure being housed in so many different locations. And one of the things that we are looking at is to showcase extensive information on the common areas of consideration for institutions and stakeholders. And then last but not least, we have uh, an easy to use comparison view. So one of the things in InfraFinder is that you can be able to compare up to four different infrastructures. So maybe let's say I'm looking at open infrastructures and I wanted to compare between uh, different options. 
you can easily be able to set up a comparison view and you can be able to compare according to their technical attributes, according to their policies, according to their community engagement systems that have been put in place, which I'll showcase shortly in a demo. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to mention is that InfraFinder is a tool that has been created with the community. Uh, we have had so many kind of uh, research sessions uh, to kind of be able to develop the utility, the data uh, for InfraFinder. But also one of the things that we would want to make very clear is that InfraFinder is also learning from other particular initiatives in the space. So you have tools like Scomcat, uh, we have uh, Re3 Data, Posi, Helios, and so many other people who we've drawn inspiration from. And also one of the things that we have is that we are more or less taking a la launch and learn approach in terms of as we launch the product, we are also getting a lot of feedback from our users. And that is very important for us to kind of keep up with continuous iteration and development across, across time. So I wanted to, let me stop there for now. I wanted to give you a brief overview of InfraFinder. I hope you can be able to see my screen. So here uh, we have InfraFinder, uh, the, the platform. And I wanted to bring to your attention a couple of things. So as I mentioned, we have 57 solutions at the moment. We have different filters that allow you to select according to a particular need that you may have. So for example, if you're looking for, let's say an annotation system, or an archive uh, information management system, you can easily be able to go to the panel. You also have this uh, technical attributes uh, section that you can be able to choose. We have a community engagement that would allow you to filter according to infrastructures that have any of these particular requirements. And so maybe perhaps let me do a bit of a test uh, so that you can be able to see. So for example, let's say we are looking at a digital asset management system. Uh, I've selected that and then we can come here and update the results. And you see it has given us two different solutions, which is Mukutu and Islandora. Uh, and then also you can also be able to easily compare. So if you want to go back to the default, you can just clear. And then for example, let's say I want to go to annotation system and then let's maybe do a comparison. Yes, so we have Mirado and Dokili here. And if you click on compare, you can easily be able to come at the bottom and add another tool. So for example, if I click here on compare, then it automatically will uh, add it here. And then I can click on compare. Then that will open this particular window that would show you all of the technical, all of the community, all of the policy uh, considerations that you can be able to evaluate when you're looking at particular infrastructures for adoption. So that in a nutshell is just a quick overview of InfraFinder uh, in terms of uh, how it operates. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to kind of look at this particular component uh, because also we do know that there's a lot of uh, open infrastructure development that's happening within the Australian uh, space. And uh, we wanted to kind of look at the value propositions in that if you were to list on InfraFinder, which is a completely free tool, uh, it allows uh, these infrastructures to showcase their key achievements and also highlight the funding needs. Uh, and this potentially might also be able to look at uh, a matching between infrastructures and research funders in future that potentially might be able to alleviate that uh, funding uh, gap that's there. Also, you have the opportunity to reach more potential adopters and funders across the world. And also one of the important things that we are looking at here is that element of peer learning and also uh, sharing of experiences uh, with other infrastructure uh, services across the board. So uh, finally, uh, if you'd want to add your service to InfraFinder. There's a QR code that we have on the screen uh, that you can be able to scan. There's also a website uh, link that we have here. So any of the two tools you can be able to use. This is a completely free 
uh, service that uh, we are just looking at kind of enhancing the sharing of information about open infrastructures to a wider community, which I'd welcome you to uh, sign up for the expression of interest form. And a member of the IOI team would be more than happy to engage with you afterwards and look at how potentially you can be able to be enrolled into the system. So thank you. Let me pause there for now. I'll be happy to take any questions after, but now let me invite my colleague Nikki to also share the screen and take us through the 2024 State of Open Infrastructure Report. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, I would like to pick up where Jerry left up to discuss the state of open infrastructure. Um, the state of open infrastructure report was initially published in a couple of months ago in um, May uh, to provide an in-depth analysis of the current landscape, the characteristic and the trends of open infrastructure. And this is also to, to highlight and support the scholarly community. Now, you may ask why undertake a two-year task to investigate the community? The purpose is to inform and advocate and drive strategic investment in open infrastructure and support equitable research participation. It encompasses also uh, analysis of over 415 million grant funding in regional policy development, governance, and structure and trends. Uh, we are all in the business of enabling uh, of enabling and supporting the research scholarly community. What does that look like? What does it mean when we say we're in the business of research community? What is it the librarians do? How do researchers want to participate? What are the policy recommendations that are taking shape or being formed or being implemented? To find that out, uh, we spent the two years to study the, 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 the ecosystem and the report essentially has taught us that we wanted to raise uh, the profile of open infrastructure, uh, eliminate patterns and funding in areas of need, establish a base of information which can be updated annually, investigate selected topics of interest to the IR2 to, to open infrastructure community, identify possible sources or courses of action to improve adoption and resourcing. The characteristic of open infrastructure we looked into what drives this. Uh, this is interesting because I'm looking at two different slides. Sorry, Jerry. Yeah. Can you go at the report yes. objective. Report objective. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes. As I said earlier, the purpose is to inform, advocate, and drive strategic investment in open infrastructure. The report objectives is to raise the profile of open infrastructure, illuminate the patterns in funding and areas of need, establish a baseline of information which can be annually updated, investigate selected topics of interest to, to open infrastructure community, and identify possible courses to improve adoption and sourcing. The characteristic of open infrastructure the data set that Jerry referred to that included 57 operational uh, infrastructure that met the criteria to be included in, in, in InfraFinder. The grant funding analysis section uh, covers over 415 million in grant funding. Um, this is a detailed analysis of grant funding distribution, highlighting the importance of sustainable financing for support for open infrastructure. The key trends also include in funding of open infrastructure prioritizes open access and community governance. In the adoption section, we covered and show growing trends of open infrastructure globally with significant regional variation. This is also tied to funding mechanisms, of course, and policy implementation. And as we know globally, policy is very much different from what's happening in Europe to what's happening in the Central Asia region to Americas, but also Africa and Latin America. Um, this also includes regional insights and an in-depth analysis of the policy development in Africa, Europe, and Latin America. And we've recently, last week, published an extensive version of the policy uh, session of the report because it is instrumentally important to understand why and how the policies are developed uh, and how they're also implemented and what the bottlenecks are. Whether it's the financing, whether it's the policy implementation, whether it's the community that is responsible for also interpreting this policy in the region. Um, 
The vision is to emphasize the, the indispensable role of open infrastructure in advancing research ecosystem and prioritizes access and participation. And it's also a call to encourage strategic investment and informed decision making to enhance resi resilience and health of open infrastructure systems. I can take some questions now if you wish. That's it, Jerry. Thank you. Sorry, just checking with you, Nikki. Was that the end of your presentation or were you going to come back? Are you having questions yeah. in between? I, this will be the end of it, but I'll have questions. If you, anybody has questions, I'm happy to also go back and forth with the report. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to both Jerry and uh, Nikki for that presentation. Um, I think, Jerry, you mentioned that IOI was established four years ago, which would have been just on, on the cusp of the pandemic, because I recall from my previous role at Call, mm -hmm. I think we were in touch with someone from IOI at the time, um, wanting to see how we could contribute or the Australian community could contribute or get involved. But mm. um, nothing really came from it, for mainly because mm. of the, the context that we were living in at the time. But also, I think we were struggling to understand how IOI really differed from initiatives like SCOS. So mm. I think a lot has obviously happened in the in the few years since then. And this was yeah. really an excellent presentation to um, to define exactly what IOI is, mm. what you do, and the InfraFinder tool. I think is obviously what now um, you know a, a prime example of what can be achieved through um, an initiative such as yours. So um, before we get on to the questions, I just wanted to mention that um, I only had a look at InfraFinder this morning myself. Um, and I, you know, fiddled around with it a bit, played around with it, um, used the filters, and I had a, quite a few questions when I started doing it. And I must say, all of my questions were answered while I was using the tool. So I thought that was a good um, reflection on on what the effort and and uh, the thought that you've put into the development of the tool. So I think um, everyone involved in that needs to be commended on that. Um, I think because we've got a very small group today. Um, if people ha have any questions for either Jerry or uh, Nikki, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, um, please do so now. Or if you prefer someone else, I can put the question to them if you prefer to put it in the chat, but um, you've got those two options now. And perhaps while we're waiting for people to consider whether they have any questions, I had more, I'm not sure whether it's really a question, it's more of a comment, I guess. Um, and that was when I was using the InfraFinder this morning, I noticed you had the little blue tick for open API, uh, which is very handy to see on the first, um, you know, the first images that come up with each block for each of those solutions. And one of the things I was wondering about, would it be useful or have you had any feedback in this regard about having something similar to indicate whether the infrastructure is purely open infrastructure or it's sort of commercial infrastructure that provides, you know, access to open services? And the sort of examples I was thinking of was where you've got something like Pressbooks um, from uh, Book Oven and OJS from PKP, which essentially are software as, as a service to the institutions that that subscribe to them, use them, um, and obviously, but obviously they're open infrastructure as well. And then you've got the other sort of open infrastructure, such as DOA, J, DOAB, the ones that have been around perhaps a bit longer. So I know you can do that through your filters with the, um, the community engagement one, I think, with the contribution part, um, I think is what it's called. Um, but I was just wondering if it was possible to have that surfaced earlier so that you can see more easily. Yes. 
I think that's that's good feedback. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we are very keen on is that the tool as we launched it is always open to iteration in terms of looking at community feedback and how best you can be able to improve that. I think that distinction between uh, the open infrastructures, pure open infrastructures and those that have like a, a commercial component to them is something that maybe perhaps we can be able to tease out a bit better. So let me hand this feedback back to our development team and then potentially we can look at if this is a change that can be incorporated in the launch that we are going to be doing in October for the, the next set of infrastructures so that perhaps it might be very easier to kind of demarcate between those two distinctions. So I think this is valuable feedback uh, that we are getting from you, Mark, and we shall be able to kind of take this back into uh, the, the technical team who are going to look at making that particular change. Because I agree with you in principle, we should be able to make that distinction a, a lot easier. Great, thanks, um, Jerry. I think Shannon's got a question. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and thanks, Jerry and Nikki, for the presentation. It was excellent. Um, you answered a number of questions I had actually, so it was uh, excellent. I was just look. I'm a big supporter of these type of uh, registries. Sorry, background and is, is Shannon Callaghan from the Australian Research Data Commons uh, Policy Advisor, da uh, Senior Data Policy Advisor there, um, and also part of the Australian Open Science Network. I'm a big fan of these type of registers. I was wondering if you could give some insight into the usage stats. So how, you know, given all the effort that these uh, take to build and maintain and, and operate, um, is it is it something that's being used a lot and um, the value that users are getting from these services? That's always a question when we propose them as a, as a way forward. Nikki, you want to take that? Yes, that's fine. All right, go. Uh, if you have, go for it, go for it. Sorry. Yeah, so if, you, if you're looking at the InfraFinder tool in itself, one of the things that we are seeing since we uh, launched the platform, I think we launched this in April. And so far, we, we've had some, some very good engagements with it. We've gotten a couple of, uh, if you look at the IOI website, there's uh, a number of articles that we have written, which are called the InfraFinder Infra Spotlight series. And so here we are looking at how different open infrastructures are using the InfraFinder tool. So for example, we've had uh, examples from open citations, uh, from uh, Crossref, uh, from uh, DOAJ and DOAB. Uh, and so we are already kind of seeing that utility. I think also one of our colleagues was at a conference uh, recently, and there was also some feedback that one of the institutions like an in university was actually actively using InfraFinder in terms of looking at different options, like they were using it and this information was actually surfaced to kind of like the, dean, the, the, the library dean to kind of help facilitate that kind of process of search uh, and utilization. So we already see that particular uh, element of, of usage. I think one of the things that's important in terms of maintaining the utility of this particular tool over time would be the, the fact that there's going to be that constant iteration. Because if you look at it, we only have 57 infrastructures at the moment. And that's why we've made a commitment to making sure that there's going to be a, a next batch of updates that are continually coming in. So for example, within the next update, we are looking at doubling the number of infrastructures to at minimum 114. And that particular process is going to be continuing over time because the more tools that we have, the more valuable this is as a resource so that you can be able to make very robust, comprehensive uh, comparisons of tools across regions. And also that's one thing that I would also want to flag. And that's also why we had a specific call to action for if there's Australian, open infrastructures that would be interested in joining InfraFinder. It's a completely free uh, tool, uh, but also we are looking at, there might be 
localized context sensitive solutions that maybe might fit the uh, Australian context much more than a tool, maybe let's say from Europe or North America. So I think that also a regional kind of lens to the tools that we add would be something that really would be important to keep adding over time. Thank you. Can I also add the, thank you, Jerry, the, the, the answer. And we've also uh, received some feedback from the National Research Education Networks, the Australian one is called Arnett, um, that the InfraFinder tool also enables the community well, that and runs the National Research Education Networks to identify the tools that are being used in the country by the research community. This also improves how they are able to maintain the source systems, improve the quality, identify possible challenges or inefficiencies for them to be able to address there and then. So this tool, this feedback wasn't something we thought to be receiving, but it, it does open another conversation of how do you, the entities tasked with providing the research community in Australia, in, in Europe, wherever else, with uh, the tools to identify and how to support this community. So the InfraFinder has become a bit of a identifying what's out there, but also improving how that can be implemented in the country, in the research community, or in the organization. Great. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Right. Um, just let me have a look if there's, I think there might be a question or no, it was just a thank you in the chat. Um, so it doesn't look as though we have any other questions coming through via the chat. I had a more um, general question, if I may ask, um, just in terms of your the funding for IOI itself. And I noticed on your website, you've got the um, what they call sustaining circle, and there's a handful of organisations there, which um, I imagine is your your key um, funders at this stage. Um, have there been any um, approaches to um, organisations in the Australasian region or Asia Pacific um, that you're aware of, or is there anything that um, we can perhaps assist with in that regard? I can take this, um, and Jerry, do please contribute because I have just joined a couple of months ago, um, so I'm new to the IOI game. Um, we are primarily funded by uh, US organizations, so the Welcome Trust is the UK-based one, but we are primarily funded by American institutions. Um, the Sustaining Circle is us inviting partners and stakeholders that are interested in supporting our work. So it attend it's essentially a more of a if you believe in what we're doing, you would like to contribute to this mission, we welcome your contribution. But for the more heavy lifting, we do apply for grants. Uh, and my job is to also identify um, more sustainable means of financing and resource mobilization for the organization. Um, so if there are organizations in the region that are interested in supporting what we do or want to understand how they can contribute to expanding uh, InfraFinder, for example, we do encourage their contribution to Sustaining Circle. So if anybody's interested, do reach out. We're all happy to have the conversation. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Nikki. And um, Jane and Shannon, I was just thinking perhaps that's a conversation that we could um, continue at the Open Science Network. Um, because as I said at the beginning, I know that um, IOI did contact call some years ago, um, but nothing came of it. So, um, but, you know, and a lot has changed in the meantime. So perhaps we can we can look at that again. All right. Well, um, I think if there's no more questions, um, just to say thank you once again to both uh, Jerry and uh, Nikki for getting up early this morning um, so that we could do this um, uh, presentation today. Um, I think it's been very interesting. Um, I really think that um, that InfraFinder tool is going to um, set, put you on the map, so to speak, um, for those who haven't uh, yet heard about IOI or um, haven't um, encountered the InfraFinder yet. I hope, I hope that it will be um, you know, promoted uh, here on out. 
and uh, and that the growth and the feedback that you're looking for will will come in the coming uh, weeks and months so thanks very much um, to both of you once again and uh, we'll keep in touch as we do with all our um, colleagues and stakeholders in the the open space so thanks once again <laughs>